it. This is it. We're starting. This is episode 345. Of wow. No, yeah, of No Laugh Track Podcast, Acme Comedy Company's podcast here in Minneapolis. My name is Justin Severson, the lucky guy that gets to host this thing every week. My guest today, I have not seen, besides the other day performing stand-up, I have not seen in five years. It's got to be a record for the longest uh, space of uh, the last time of appearances yeah. between the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Five years ago, Dave Fulton. Yeah, yeah. Um, I blame you because I've been here and you have not been here. You should. You should blame. So it's your fault. <laughs> it is my fault. It is definitely my fault. Yeah. Um. So we have about, you know, we'll do about like 45 minutes or so here. And I what? Want, yeah, I want you to tell me everything that you've done in the last five years. Start with, uh, let's see, it was May of 2014, so June 2014, go. Uh, well, May 2014, <laughs> um, when I was here, uh, I had bad news. A friend of mine uh, died. He had um, Jeez. Uh, yeah, throat cancer. But And he had given me a 1968 Norton Fastback motorcycle. Um, he had it restored and then it sat in his garage for nine years and, um, he was, uh, Stocker Channing's partner for like 22 years and 25 years. Okay. And, um, so yeah, uh, yeah, Dan Gillum, just a really, really great guy. And he had this bike and I'm into motorcycles and I said, Hey, what are you gonna do with that Norton in your garage? Cause they had a beautiful house up on, off of Mulholland drive. And he's like, well, yeah, I, I'll put, I'll give it a good home. He's like, yeah, come get it. And I'm like, what do you want for it? And he goes, no, just come get it. So it cost me like 500 bucks to get it shipped back to Idaho and then another 1000 to get it shipped out to um, England. And I put another grand into it to get the thing running and then took a picture of it in February of, of uh, 14. I said, hey, you know, with a, with a U.K. plate on it. <clears throat> and he's going, oh, man, it looks great, it looks great. I said, yeah, I'll see you next time you're in town. And then while I was here, a friend of mine back in London said, did you hear about uh, uh, American Dan? I'm like, no. And he's like, yeah, he died. Jesus. I was, I was like, shit, shit. Uh-oh. Yeah. So I sent Stockard um, a big box of Bendix mints because she likes those, and I haven't heard from anybody since though. So uh, Bendix is that a name <laughs> brand? Bendix, yeah, Bendix, B E N D I C T S, Bendix. Okay. Yeah, Bendix bitter mints. They're an English thing. How uh, how's the bike now? It's great. Yeah, I, I ride it all through London. It's it's fucking hilarious. No, so. we've talked. To you, you, this is your third time on this podcast. It's been a long time, but you people that know anything about you know you're a motorcycle guy. Yeah, uh, motorcycle. I like you know I like burning fossil fuels, and I, I'm into <laughs> motorcycles because they take up less space. Um, yeah, and I build bikes and restore bikes, and, and I'm trying to build a bike right now. Have and, you uh, uh, got your your motorcycle fixed by riding around the scooters in Minneapolis here this week. <laughs> oh, my God, no. <clears throat> the scooters are weird. I mean, because uh, I saw those in Brussels. They had those in in, um, in Brussels. They're just, you know, it's one of those things because you pay for it, and then you get to a spot, and you get off it, and then, you know, if, if it's still there when you come back out, great. If not, then you go find another one. Yeah. Yeah, there's, like, little orphan children everywhere. And <laughs> and I'm always amazed because it's like, the, you know, the, the, the rent-a-bike thing, everybody has that all over the world. No. Uh, big, ugly, heavy bikes, and, you know, cost a buck or a pound to get on it and yeah. ride around for a half hour. Not a great deal. But it, I, and then I see the, the electric scooters, and I'm like, wow, everybody in Minneapolis got really fucking lazy. Lazy, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and decided to become children. <laughs> so they rent these things like little juvenile whores and then leave them on the, on the roadside when they're done riding them. Yeah. I don't know what to think about those. I just I really don't. It's, it's odd. You're not uh, you're not supposed to ride them on the sidewalk, but, but they, they do. seem dangerous as hell in the streets yeah. too. Yeah, I had a guy. I was on on the sidewalk. He goes, hey, 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 and I turned around, and he goes, uh, and he went whipping by me. And he goes, little room. I'm like, get on the goddamn road. Yeah. Uh huh. And you know, and he just kept riding away. I've yeah. also seen like three kids on one at once. Yeah, like, I saw oh, that. Oh, that's. <laughs> I saw that too. I would have been doing the same thing. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> Yeah. Building the jump, trying to get our money, all would, our money together. I would be together. jumping them. I yeah. would be jumping Jumps, no yeah. doubt. Uh-huh. Yeah, totally, totally. Uh-huh. Probably would have ended up in the water somewhere. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have those in London at all. And they never will because they would just steal them. Yeah. They'd be gone. Uh-huh. You know, London is a major, huge, metropolitan, international city full of people from all over the world. Within, uh, there's a huge ring road that goes all the way around London called the M25. And um, a little while back, they did a survey, and almost 300 languages are spoken within the M25. Holy crap. Yeah. And I love when you come over here, people were like, you know, oh, we don't like to hear Mexicans talking Spanish. And like, we, go back to your country, learn to speak English. I'm like, really? Why don't you come out to London? England is, is like Tom Rhodes says, is the original honky motherland, right? <laughs> so, and it is. I mean, you know, it, you know, it is. And then, but there's people from all over the world. And, and, Nothing will disturb you more than being walking around in London and hear a German mother yell at her kids, 
you know, you're like, and you're like, holy shit, man. Yeah. I feel uh-huh. like I'm getting rounded up here, you know. <laughs> or you hear, you know, people with an Arabic accent, you know, somebody, you know, with, with Arab, speaking Arabic yeah. or, or Farsi or, you know, yelling into a phone. You're thinking, are they calling in orders here, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's unsettling. How many of those languages do you speak? Uh, zero. No, yeah, because I'm American. We bomb you until you learn ours. That's, That's right. what we do. Yeah, I can order food in French, you know, uh, if I need be, you know, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, and everybody knows a little bit of Spanish just to get a beer and yeah, food. Right, right. <coughs> and, and, yeah, right, right. And to cost, you know, puto. We I was going to say the swear words. Yeah, yeah, puto de madre, pendejo, all that. You learn all that kind of stuff. Oh, so. I was, a few years ago, I was uh, working with a guy uh, born in Mexico, had been... Well, that's pff, shit. I just realized that could lead into a whole other story. A guy that was born in Mexico, uh, working here, I worked with him. He's been since been uh, ICE deported. No. But yeah, because of our fuck. Yeah, a whole nother. That I could do a whole nother podcast <clears throat> on that bullshit. But uh, he corrected me once on one of the swear words I was using. He, he, he's like, Migo, that's not even a word. You're, you're making that up. Oh, like, nice. I was putting the wrong, like, feminine or masculine. Or oh, whatever yeah, it was. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. We, don't, we don't say it like that. So it was a little embarrassing. But yeah, he's gone now. Victor is uh, back in Mexico because he was fucking deported. Uh, that's, Wait a minute, oh. Did, didn't Victor work behind the bar? <laughs> no, not that guy. Okay, all right. There was a, not that guy, but no. there, was, there was a guy years ago that worked behind the bar who um, had a fake passport, oh. an American passport, and he was living on that. So um, no, this guy was uh, doing. But he's not here anymore. Job with, nice. Yeah. 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 Ah, what a deal. Um, so now what, you're back. Let's talk about you being back in Minnesota and Minneapolis. You've done yeah, two oh shows God. so far. <clears throat> um, we've done a couple of shows, uh, it, and it's great because when I do shows over in, in, in Europe, in the U.K., it's usually, sh- you know, we're doing 20, 30 minutes, and um, it's a shorter show, which is fine. It is what it is. I mean, I like doing longer shows. It's, it's okay, but, you know, it still pays good. I'm making a living at this. And Let me, let me just jump in right there. Like, when I look at your website and I see like, uh, your to your dates and it has a you know uh, the week here and then it has you have stuff like through like September and October mm-hmm. those dates that you're doing at these clubs around and like I saw some in Scotland and yeah. in England and stuff so you're just doing 20 minutes or are those headlining 45 minutes 50 <coughs> no minutes? no I'm, I'm doing you know if I'm closing shows like uh, at the stand or the glee clubs or um, like I'll be in Dubai in a couple of weeks um, I'm doing you know 30 minutes someplace sometimes 40 but most of the time like, but when I worked the comedy store in London we all do 20 minutes, you know, and it's interchangeable. So y- there is no closer. Um, you you have to be able to close the show. And um, so you got to be strong. So people show up to see. Uh, they come to see comedy. Yeah. How many How many will they see in one night then? How many um, performers? Five. Five. Yeah, they'll five. Okay. They see an MC, and the MC is very strong. He's, he's usually, you know, typically one of the stronger builds, you know, guys on the act. Okay. If, if not equal with everybody else. And then there's, you know, they do, um, they do two comics, and they do a break, and then two more comics, and that's the end of the show. And, um, and it's not cheap. I mean, London's expensive anyway. Yeah. And uh, so like the other places, like the Glee Clubs in Birmingham and, and um, you know, and Cardiff and, and um, yeah, they uh, – and Glasgow. And Glasgow, I do uh, – well, like, I work the stand in Glasgow and, and Edinburgh and Newcastle, England. They, um, I'm closing those shows, so I'll do, like, 35, 40 minutes. You know, but I'm making more money. Yeah. You know, nice. but the other shows, like the uh, the London shows, when you do, when everybody's doing 20 minutes, we're all getting paid the same. Um, the downside of that is most of the time I'm closing the shows, uh, the shows outside of London, I'm closing. Everybody's making the same money, but I'm closing. Hmm. <clears throat> and I'm like, well, look, can I go in first so I can go home first? Right? You know? Yeah. And the booker's like, no, 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 no. You have to close the show. Yeah. And, and if you say, well, I want more money, they just quit booking you. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So learn you go, that le- can learn that lesson the hard way. So you're like, okay. I mean, I've, I've seen other people do it, but you know what? It's it's. Um, I don't have a problem with it. I'm like, okay, fine. You know, um, people complain, oh, you can't make a living doing the circuit in the UK anymore. And I'm like, well, what are your expenses? <laughs> you know, sure. I mean, my expenses are. I've gotten it down to. I know what I need to make a month, and uh, I cover that easily. Yeah. And um, and the rest of it is, you know, I take care of uh, take care of my family and pay some bills and you know get some other stuff done. Yeah. Do you, you ever get booked on a show like, well, it's five Americans tonight. It's the <coughs> no. American show. You know, it's it's white guy night. No, it's, well, there's always white. It's always white guy night. Always, always white course. guy night. Yeah, it's never white girl night, by the way. No, no. Yeah, which is too bad. But I the, agree. But the, um, no, they don't typically like to put Americans on the same bill. There is a couple Americans working in the UK that I've worked with. Um, this guy named uh, uh, Scott Capurl. Uh okay. Very funny man. He's out of San Francisco. Gay. Does... You know, talks about that on stage. He's married uh, to this really great guy um, who's from Brazil. 
And uh, man, Scott is so funny. Oh my God. He does lines like, um, uh, what is it? The, uh, uh, he goes, yeah, it turns out uh, you uh, can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery if you have a tattoo. Well, you have to have the right tattoo. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. He's always pushing it. Always pushing it. Oh, my God. And, he, you know, and he, is, he stands on stage. And even though he's married, he, he flirts with people in, in the audience. Nice. And you're like, oh, you're nice. You're nice. You're, I'm trying to envision you biting an orange. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah maybe after the show. He, he put me on the ground one night. He goes, maybe after the show, uh, you know, uh, later on. And, you know, when I was single. I'd be with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do me a favor. Don't eat anything two hours beforehand because I don't want to clean up the mess. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know. I know. And yeah, I'm like, holy crap. And he, but he still works in the States. And he works punchline and stuff. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, it's just weird. I, I, I love him to death. But, no, to, to answer your question, no, I don't. I mean, I've done shows. Uh, I've been on bills with Rich Hall. He still lives there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, which is great and it's a treat. But I've done shows with other Canadians. But not a lot of a lot of Americans. Okay. And um, mainly because there's not a lot of Americans out there working. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's um, – I mean, Americans will come in and – I mean, big-name Americans will come in and play. But um, but the guys who work the circuit, you know, no, nah, they don't come out. So in the last five years since your last uh, Acme, have you been coming? Have you come back to perform Oh, yeah, I still, I still got uh, – I got property in Idaho. You do? Um, so um, the – <clears throat> it's it's it, it just land and and um you know my my uh, uh i was getting back about three or four times a year when my dad was alive and he passed away three years ago okay and um and then also you know my wife and i we adopted a little boy yeah we're definitely gonna talk about that yeah yes. so and i want to stay home for that so um yeah so your priorities kind of kind of shift a bit and now i would come back to go climbing go ice climbing or, or uh, snowboarding or that kind of thing and um brandon our producer said you guys yeah i know a date <laughs> yeah, yeah we um and i but i go out to the alps and do that or go to scotland and do that um that's kind of taken a bit of a backseat as of late because i've been dealing with some other things but for the most part yeah it's um i mean i still i think it's, you know i still love the country there's no doubt about america but you know i um one of the things that prevents me from moving back is um well you know we've got a house in london so you, you don't walk away from that and um and also you know we have uh, we have national health and it's uh, and it's funny because people who are uh, you know very against, very bitter toward the Affordable Care Act, aka Obamacare, yeah. you know they're like, oh, I had a great plan, and now I didn't have the great plan, and oh, this and that. And I'm saying, yeah, hey, I'm with you, man. Uh, you know, it should have gone you know further, it, you know, but everybody's been brainwashed to the idea that national national health is is communism or socialism and that's going to lead to this and fascism and also and it's just it's bullshit it's all fucking propaganda <clears throat> and so what we we pay it's roughly between eight and eleven percent of your net income that goes for national health and if you do the numbers and you know, i get full coverage yeah. everything you know and i just i couldn't afford it over here it'd be 1800 bucks a month you know and and in, in in the uk it works out to about a thousand bucks a year yeah and, I uh, imagine that you that like uh thankfully like for me my wife has a job that offers an excellent uh, benefit you know insurance benefits yeah. so I use hers. Yeah. Uh but I know that like comedians that oh, live here they have nothing. Yeah. They have nothing, yeah. you know. I I mean it's come up on this podcast before the amount people have to spend is insane. Oh yeah. Yeah. Insane. yeah. And and it's funny because people you know they argue it's always like I don't. I, don't, I, I try to stay off social media a little bit more now because I don't want to argue with anybody because nobody <laughs> ever admits they're wrong on social media. I try to. I, I didn't know that. Thanks for telling me that okay. kind of thing. But but you know I'd be no 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 this and that and they'll go oh I saw in England blah blah and I, I said look what you're doing is you're sitting in your house in America trying to tell me what the weather is outside my window. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. Right? Uh huh. Go oh, I heard this this and this. Yeah. There's places in the UK where it is not working and it needs help. But that is not generally w- how it is. I mean, luckily, I live in an area where, you know, we have a really great hospital within walking distance. My, you know, the doctor's office I go to is a five-minute walk away. If I need an appointment that day, I, I ring at 8.30 in the morning. That's when the office opens, and you ring till you get through. And sometimes it's like the first ring. Sometimes it's the fifth ring, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> and, they, and they go, hi, I go, can I get in today? And they'll go, um, what's wrong? And you're like, well, I got this. I got that. You know, I'm sick. This, you know, whatever. You know, and like, okay, well, how's 10:30? And you're like, okay, 10:30. And then you walk in, and um, and you sit. Not 10:30 six months from now. No, no, no. Yeah, there's no waiting time, and you yeah. wait there, and and the and then you're in. I mean, um, I remember on a Sunday, I saw something in my eye, and I thought, you know, because I was working in the garage, and I thought maybe some oil or something. So I'm trying to wash it out, and the contact's not working. I thought, oh, there's something wrong here. It didn't hurt. 
Yeah. So um, I made an appointment on um, on that Sunday, called up, you know, the, the, the emergency number, not, you know, like 911, but, and they <laughs> said, okay, so they put me in with this other doctor, this is eye doctor, and she looked at you, she said, I can't see anything, go to the eye clinic tomorrow, and so she told me where it was in the hospital, I said, okay, <clears throat> so I walked right in, I said, hey, look, I've got something in my eye, I can't see, you know, it's like a black thing, like a spider web or something, mm-hmm. and they went, oh, okay, have a seat. So she typed my name in, and about 20 minutes later, I got my name called, go in, they do the eye drops, wait for the eye drops to take effect, go in, look at me, and uh, it turned out I had a torn retina. Oh, ow. Yeah, I had a tear retina. That doesn't sound good. No, no, and, and the doctor said, well, you're getting old, and that's what happens. I said, is there any way to cure it? And he's like, no, no. He goes, what'll happen? And he gave me a sheet of paper, he said, this is what's happening, this is, it's normal, you know, it doesn't happen to everybody, but it's not, you know, it's anything to cause for concern. He goes, in the next, you know, week or so, if you get flashes of light or more of this, come back, you know, but otherwise, what'll happen? So I started looking up, and, and, and this was, you know, gosh, you know, nine months ago, and it's slowly just fading away now. And um, and it's like a little floater. You follow it around and stuff, but it's not as nearly as bad as it was. I kept thinking it was like a hair in my I, every time I'd wash away. Or what is always oh, that's, that's my floater. Now all I <laughs> want to do is Google how I can prevent tearing my retina. Yeah, well you can't. Yeah, that's <laughs> yes. the thing. You know, and I said don't take any impacts to the head. This that. Oh, oh thanks. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. You know. But the the point being, you know, I walked in, walked out. I didn't write anybody a check. Nobody's chasing after me for this. Mm-hmm. It was all covered under the fact that I have national insurance. And what's really interesting is because we do have socialized medicine there, and they have it in France. They have in Germany and all the other, you know, first world countries in in the uh, in Europe, for the most part, um, the uh, we were getting a lot of medical tourists, you know, abusing the system. You know, people coming from other countries because they, they wouldn't turn them away. Sure. Oh, yeah. And so they show up and go, "I need this, I need that." And the big joke was one of the hospitals in London. They were, used to refer to it as Heathrow Terminal Six because they would just as soon as they'd land, they go straight to the hospital. Gotcha. <laughs> and um, so the the uh, the government there about I don't know, three, four years, four years ago, maybe five years ago. Just put a stop to that. They said, "Look, you're not. You can't use any any of the services unless you pay into the uh, into the system." Well, that makes sense. Yeah, and what uh, you know, and by the way, when you pay for it, it's still cheaper than it is here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, but, but just do a little <laughs> bit. You know? Yeah, but what I thought was interesting was one of the top three abusers, uh, a medical tourist, were American. I was going to say you're going to say American. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh-huh. You know. And now they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe i got to pay for my chemo. It's $54,000 now. And I'm like, mm, it's still cheaper than what you mean. Yeah. yeah, there was a whole thing in the news here recently about um, families that have been traveling from the Twin Cities to Canada oh, to yeah. get their diabe- diabetic uh, yeah, they, medication, yeah, the insulin. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's so much cheaper there. Yeah. So much. And they're, you know, like they're, they're collecting money from cash from other families, going up there, getting as much as they legally can, and bringing it back here. Yeah, so, so they're all connected. To that. Yeah, it's and it's it's. Um, they did a thing a little while back. It's been a couple of years ago, and they they figured out for a family of four, this is how much it would cost you know in U.S. dollars you know for a year for for all the medical stuff you need from like you know let's say a broken arm, the flu you know you know this cuts scrapes it's just stitches no major operations just the normal kind of thing and we're talking just like from ibuprofen to you know a visit to the emergency room sure. that kind of thing. <laughs> and um, in in France it was like three thousand six hundred bucks. In the UK it was three thousand seven hundred. In Germany it was three thousand, you know, four hundred. And in, in the US it was seven thousand three hundred for the exact same. I mean, they did line by line all the way down, you know. And and I find it really interesting that the government and the powers to be and insurance companies all defend that. And they're like, well, you know, we, we need free choice, and that'll drive the price down. So I think John Stewart said it best when he made you know, the the case for the uh, the first responders. Yes, nine eleven. Yeah. yeah, he said you know these people have to make a choice between living or having a place to live. You know, and yeah. and America is the richest, most powerful nation on the earth, and I'm proud of that. Three hundred twenty million people, but because of the separation of wealth, they can't take care of their own people. Yeah, you know, so we have the we have a higher infant mortality rate than. Yeah, I think we're like, you know, we're way down there, way down there, because people are afraid to go to the doctor because they can't afford it, you know. And the survivability of cancer is is down because people are afraid to go to the doctor. And by the time they show up, it's like, dude, I got bad news for you. Yeah. You should have been here six months ago. And, yeah, so, um, and I think that's sad, you know. If you have great insurance, ma'am, you're right in there, boom. You just said we, <laughs> as in we Americans? Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever say we as uh, as a Brit? No. no. Well, I, we, I say, you know, I say, I talk about, that's a good, that's a good you picked that up. I say, well, I'm in Britain. I say, well, in England, because I live in England. 
So you okay. don't say Britain, you say England. Okay, sure. So yeah, in England, this, England, that, you know. It's like nothing too is, because <clears throat> um, I'm in my 50s now, is people go, oh, you had your colonoscopy yet? I'm like, no, no, I haven't. I haven't had a colonoscopy. And they're like, oh my God, are you kidding me? And I'm like, when I turned 50, I remember I went into the doctors and said, look, all my friends in America are having colonoscopies. And this really great doctor said, do you have a history of colon cancer in your family? I'm like, no, no. I said, you know, my mom had, you know, cancer. My dad had, you know, uh, esophageal cancer. And he's like, well, you know, have you done this? Have you done this? And I'm like, no. And, you know, so he took, you know, they did a vascular examination. So they took all the blood out of me and did this and that. And they said, look, you have a heart of a guy three years younger than you. Um, what's your diet like? Do you smoke? No. Are you a heavy drinker? Not really. You know, um, what's your diet? So I told him the diet, do you do this, this, and this, blah, blah. And the guy goes, look, you're not, you're not at risk. So the, um, <laughs> is that an English <laughs> ringtone? Yeah, it might have been. Hold on. <laughs> the, um, two oh eight. I don't know who that is. <coughs> oh, I do know who that is. Uh oh. That's all right. You can leave a message. And, um, yeah, so um, he's like, at 60, you have a colonoscopy, and you can pay for it. I go, how much is it? He goes, well, it's pretty expensive. It's like, you know, 1,600 pounds, you know, which is like $2,200 or something. Okay. You know, colonoscopies here cost like five, six, ten grand, depending on Oh, do they? Know. I know. Yeah, I don't know. You know, so, uh, yeah, I'm the, you know, I eat a lot of roughage. I eat a lot of, you know, <laughs> um, shred of wheat and uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. There's no super bl- colon blood. There's there's no blood in my stool. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm not losing weight. I got no. I'm not, I've done the symptoms, and um, so yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about maybe paying for it next year just because everybody oh, in the UK they're like, oh, but over here like, oh my god, you're yeah, doom and gloom. Oh yeah, yeah. So because um, you guys you've been sold on the idea that you've got to get this done, mm-hmm. and it's a money maker. The guy's colon. Guys who do, you know, rectal examinations, they have, they have a really nice boat. <laughs> nice vacation homes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They have a house here and over there and everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah, I want to talk to – I saw on um, – I think it was your Facebook. Are you recording this week? Are you recording? Yes. Yeah? <clears throat> yeah, Dan's recording the whole thing. Yeah, he um, – we talked about it. Stand Up Records. Yeah, Stand about, Up yeah. Records. We recorded it when I was here five years ago. Yeah, and, that's what I thought. And Dan never edited it, never got that together. And – um. So we had a little talk about that when I came back this time. And so, wait, a, let me get it straight here. So your album, Based on a True Story, was recorded in, like, 2012 or 13? Yeah, yeah. And then you came back here, like, the last time you were here, recorded yeah, again. recorded again. And that never was released. It's never released. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then, um, so we're recording this 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 week, and and Dan listened to it, and he knows the stuff I did last time, and he goes, well, yeah, we got two albums here. So we're going we're gonna to cut another album another couple albums on that and get it out and then um so yeah i gotta come up with a title for the for the okay. second one all right and um and i think this one will just be called uh this shouldn't work <laughs> 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 and um yeah so we'll get done and i think we're gonna do a video on um friday yeah we're gonna set up the cameras do some videos and get some stuff out there because it's all about social media now um, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, there's a lot of clubs in the in the UK that do video recordings, and I've been getting those, and I've been a little lax as of late because I've been busy with some other stuff, um, putting out some clips and getting them done. Uh, I've, there's two clubs I recorded from. One was in Brighton, one was in uh, in London, and uh, a friend of mine who's doing the editing, he's got the he just got a hold of me because the editing's done. So when I fly back, I'll said I'll pick a couple clips out and we'll put them up on my YouTube channel and then, and get some distribution on that. And then, um, but I've been busy because I I wrote and directed uh, five short films. In 2011, and finally got control of all of those, and we packaged them together in this thing called Bad Times, and it's uh, Bad Time, and the S is a f- the number five because there's five films. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, sold it to Shorts TV, and it's going to be released on iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play in oh. about in about two weeks. No shit. Yeah. What is it called? It's called Bad Times. What's that? S. So yeah. The five. The five is the S. Bad yeah. Times. So written, right. written and directed by me, and uh, they're all really. It's essentially me in a garage telling a friend of mine how sick and twisted and fucked up the U- people in, in Britain are and then then I show these little short films that I, I did and um, and they're all dark you know I mean like people die you know and stuff like that or they get beat up and yeah so default and stuff yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and I had some really great uh, people that are kind of known in the UK I had Ahmed Jalili was in one Ahmed was he was in Mamma Mia he was the jailer in The Mummy he's been in a ton of stuff okay. another body my Michael Smiley who is brilliant he um he did a bunch of amazing independent films with a Ben Whiteley Ben Wheatley sorry and um he was in Star Wars and and some other things and did a film with Jude Law 
And then, um, yeah, Joanna Hartley, who was – Joe was in – this is England. Mm-hmm. And um, and she was in um, – <clears throat> yeah, so she um, – She's in it, and it's just going to be great. I mean, it was really fun to look at everything again and just re-familiarize myself. And there will be trailers involved, so you can see come of that and um, and look it up. But, yeah, it'll be I'll, be I'll be posting the shit out of it. Good. And all the actors will um, will be posting stuff up, so we'll get some you – know, I'm thinking about hiring, like, a media producer to get the word out there. Oh, wow. And um, Big uh, time. Yeah. Well, so, that's really cool. And then I, I did another one. <laughs> um, the I, I wrote and directed um, – this thing called Worthless. It was it was uh, another short film I did last last fall that's made it into a couple of film festivals. And uh, another thing, dark woman comes out. She's broken a teapot, looking for a husband. Finds a husband in the garage, trying to hang himself, and uh, failing, gets him back up on the stool. His, his arms, are, his arms, uh, his wrists are zip tied, and, uh, and it comes out that um, she can't cut him down. So it comes out that um, he had an affair with a woman down the road, and got her pregnant. And he can't put up, he can't deal with it, so he's going to do himself in. So she's like, you can't, you got to be a father, you know, you, you, know, you can't do this, you can't do this. You know, all right, fine. So he goes, well, you know, get the wire cutters and cut the zip ties on my wrist and I'll get myself down. So she's digging through the workbench and finds all these unfinished products she hasn't finished. And finally finds the, 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 the wire cutters and then goes, uh, I'm about ready to cut them down. And uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll try to, I'll try, I'll try to get to it, I'll try to get to it. And she goes, is that the bin man? You know, the trash guy. And... Um, <clears throat> And he's like, yeah, did you put the bins out? Did you put the recycling out? He goes, no, I forgot. She goes, it's four weeks in a row. He's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll get to it. And she looks at him. And she goes, you know what you are? Worthless. And kicks the chair off from underneath him lets him swing. <laughs> oh, my God. And then leaves the garage and stops and goes, <sighs> goes back in the garage. He's choking out. And she gets the tea, the teapot, the broken teapot and the, uh, and the glue. And she goes, well, something's going to get fixed today. And oh. just leaves him. Oh, my God. <laughs> All my stuff's like that. <laughs> yeah. So, um wow <laughs> wow dave <laughs> <clears throat> yeah it was um it's like the first one i did with michael and ahmed it was really fun we shot it at night and uh, they were so great they're so pros and it was a guy who comes into a petrol station um he's trying to get petrol to get back home before his wife finds out about the affair or some shit like that and he doesn't have any money and they won't take a check and his credit card's been not denied so he robs the petrol station and then he's so shit at it and the guy tells him you're so shit at this you know that he convinces the guy behind the counter to teach him how to rob a petrol station. So they switch roles, and then he finds out it's a fake gun, and so he's mad at him. So now the guy's trying to rob the petrol station is behind the counter. He comes in, and he ends up robbing the guy who tried to rob him, leaves, and leaves him behind the petrol station in charge. To run it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it was really fun, you know. And all the stuff I do is um, I, sh- I-, I write it with the idea it's all single location. So we shoot it all in a day and one go. And uh, it's all in digital, and then um, yeah, so it's uh, it was fun. Yeah. Where so I, I we got to talk about you your growing family that has grown since the last time you were here. Yeah, I mean what what part of the process were you in when you were here last time? Were you guys uh, just still trying on your own? No, to have a kid. No, we no. um 2014 we were. We we tried. We done the we done. You know, we tried naturally. That didn't work out. Tried IVF. That didn't work out. Tried um, embryonic adoption, which is available in Spain. It's subsidized by the government and the Catholic Church because they want more kids. And so we went to Madrid, and they do a profile of you and and your partner, figure out what you look like physically, and they match you up with the Spanish equivalent and mix a cocktail and do a turkey baster injection up the old kazoo and hope it takes. And, uh, <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, and it didn't what? with my wife, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh my God! What Embry- is that called? Embryonic adoption. Yeah. So it didn't work with us, and so she's like, "Let's adopt." And so we went through all the hoops on that, and which was horrible. And um, and meeting the people involved were just—I mean, some were great, but most of them were just fucking clueless. And um, so yeah, and then we got approved for that, and um, we we looked at two kids, and the first one. Um, we're, we're like, oh, we are approved. For, we're like, yeah, we like you, we like you, we like you. And then four weeks later, we're like, well, where is he? And they're like, oh, I'm sorry, two weeks ago we gave it to somebody else. And then <clears throat> we were looking at this other kid whose mother was a junkie. So he was born with um, uh, addicted to opiates for his three, first three months of his life. And we were denied that kid because the lady in charge hated me, this white middle-class bitch. And, and um, 
so uh, the wife's like, look, I'm going to do this whether you want it or not. So I got involved, and and we found, you know, this little boy. And um, he is yeah, he's amazing. And, and he was born in London. He was taken at birth. There was no defects, no trauma, no violence in the home. We never knew his birth parents. Raised by, you know, foster mother. You know, we got him when he was about 19, 20 months. And... Um, yeah, his mother was second generation Jamaican. His father's Nigerian. So guess what? <laughs> you know, and uh, me being an Idaho boy, it's just kind of like, whoops. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and my wife's Londoner, so she's totally multicultural. You know, her, her, she's a Irish Welsh background, and she's like, no, yeah, 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 no problem. You got a problem with this? And you know, me trying to be the progressive, like, yeah, no, no problem with this. You know, and and you do the typical white guy thing. You know, I got a lot of black friends. Yeah, that's, yeah, you know, I have no problem with black I've always people. been cool with them. I'm cool I black, get it. Which is what white people say, as opposed to just shut the fuck up and treat them like <laughs> no. normal people. Right. <laughs> oh. And um, so, oh. yeah, I mean, he's totally changed my outlook on how I look at black people. There's, you know, in a positive way. And um, so, I, yeah, I, I'm, I, I, you know, without sounding weird, but it'll sound weird, I am way nicer to black people than probably I am with white people now, you know? Yeah, and it's like telling I, I'm on stage. I said, "Yeah, I see black people now," and I just look at them too long, and they look at me, and and it's all I can do to go. I got one of you at home. You can't, you know. <laughs> whoa, no, no. whoa, 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 whoa! That, 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 that didn't come out right. That didn't come out right. So, um, <clears throat> he's he's there voluntarily. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he probably yeah. doesn't want to leave. I remember one time we were in town, and she's and it was the three of us, and she goes, "Okay, I have to go back to whatever and get some stuff, and you go home with daddy." He's like, "No, oh, he's a real mom as a boy." Oh, I'm going with mommy. I'm like, come on, hon, let's go back. He's like, no, I'm going with mommy. I'm like, come on. He's like, no, stay with dad. You'll be fine. And so he, I'm standing next to him, and he's standing on the, on the street corner crying. goes, mommy, I want mommy, mommy. And this guy walks up and goes, can I help? I'm a father. Is there a problem here? And, I, and then so I went, what? And then my son looked at me and looked at him and went, holy shit, what the fuck is this? And back up and, like, came over next to me. And at that moment, this white guy went, oh, shit. <laughs> right? Yeah. I assume that somebody left a black kid. Yes. You know. Oh, I, I, too, can help. Yeah, yeah. I am a white guy. Yeah. You know, obviously, somebody has left this black kid. He's going he's gonna to go feral if we don't do something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we just looked at him, and then he realized, uh, and I'm like, no, mate, we're good. Then he went, uh, 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 okay, all right, and just, like, walked away. He's going to be the next uh, artful dodger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, am I? You know. So, um, but, yeah, he is, uh, he is amazing, and it's That's great, so great. To, It's great to raise him in London because, I mean, obviously, you know, we have our issues with racism there, but it's we have so many people from so many places in the world. It's, you know, he doesn't really stand out. And uh, he stands out because he's beautiful, but, you know, he doesn't stand out. And um, and you don't really realize that, till, for me, until I come back to places like Minneapolis and realize, God damn, there's a lot of white people here. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's some serious fucking white privilege happening here, and you mm-hmm. don't even know it, you know. And my problem is because I live in such a multicultural area, even though where we live is, is, is pretty middle class, which middle class in England means you're making six figures or more. You know, it's not like middle class here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm not middle class. I'm not no, neither middle am I. class. <laughs> yeah, right. But we live in an area like that. Yeah. And um, so it, it's still, you know, it's still multicultural. You see a lot of people from all over. And um, so, yeah, and you come here and you're like, damn, man, you know. So I don't feel comfortable in a predominantly white area anymore. Can I? Okay. Uh, I didn't think I'd talk about this today, but... Um so there was this thing going around Twitter a week or so ago. I don't even know who started it, but it just it started. Social experiment. Uh, reply below with the first grade you had a non-white teacher. Oh, wow. That's really great. Yes. And there were a lot of very uh, guilty-sounding white people, you know, like, I never, I never did. I never did. I'm sad to say I never did. And I didn't reply to it, but I'll just tell you that my first non-white teacher was the first one I ever had in kindergarten. My first black teacher was in fourth grade. That was my full-time fourth grade teacher. Uh, she knew Martin Luther King. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Like, I learned so much black history in fourth grade in St. Paul, Minnesota. It was crazy. Wow. That's yeah. Cool. So you answer that question. How about for you in northern Iowa? <coughs> I mean, Idaho. North Pardon Idaho. Me. Yeah, North Idaho. 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 Um, my first non-white teacher was in graduate school in New York City. See? Yeah, that was some other answers. Not till college. <laughs> Not yep. till college. Because mm. I, I did, 
uh, undergraduate work in, in um, University of Idaho, but I was in music, and um, we didn't have any people of, you know, of color, none, and um, the, and in high school, oh, God, no, man, there was only one black kid in my whole class. Wow. Lenny Rehard. Wow. And in hindsight, he was mixed race, but we called him black, <laughs> and, um, and Lenny's a great guy, and we had one uh, Japanese guy, Bob Lamb. And that was it, man. The rest of it Real was just, Japanese sounding name. There, just Bob. yeah. <laughs> it, all the rest of it was just all you know white crackers, man. Yeah, well, and, there you go. Um, yeah, and huh. it was. Um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's that, that's that's a really really great question. And you know, my wife, she probably like you know, I've never known anybody who wasn't you know of a minority. And and that's the thing that's it, that's I find interesting is there's that whole pushback about. You know, multiculturalism is a dirty word and that kind of stuff. And I don't want this. And the, and the white races lose. There was no such thing as white privilege. And I'm like, you are such a fucking moron, you know. Yeah. And and that's one thing I wish America just hasn't done yet is they haven't embraced the fact that this country is built on it's built on racism. We wouldn't have be as far as we are in the history books if it wasn't for you know the slavery thing. You know, the UK gave up slavery. It was in 1807 or something like that. And of course, they have they're still racist in that respect, but. <clears throat> what they did is they went to all the people that owned slaves, and and the government just paid them off. They just said what you know because they looked that's property, so we will essentially pay for the, your property to be released. reimbursed. Yeah. yeah, and it almost bankrupt the empire. And we're talking nineteenth century Britain, early nineteenth century Britain, and they hit they had bank man, they had some serious ass sure, cash. Happening. Yeah, and and during the Civil War, but it's you know in the in the eighteen fifties, late eighteen fifties, once Lincoln was elected. <clears throat> there's abolitionists and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things was, you know, and they entertained like, oh, we took these people from another country. We, we should find their own country, you know. And Lincoln, people say, well, Lincoln was for that. And he goes, no, he wasn't. But he entertained all the, the possibilities that you know, we could take. There's a really great uh, um, uh, book out there. Uh, it's called um, uh, The Fire from the Fire Below. And it talks about a lot of this. And and there were people that, you know, so the uh, the plantation owners were going, well, you know, we, we, you know, if you want us to free these people, then you have to reimburse us. And Lincoln said, it will bankrupt the Republicans. We can't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, so they left it up for the states. And, of course, like Mississippi, they all voted. That, you know, all these people haven't evolved and all this kind of bullshit. And yeah. that's the Civil War, you, you know, went from there. Yeah. And um, and even then, and then, you know, then there was the uh, Jim Crow days, you know, because, the you know, the industrialists and the slave owners, <laughs> once they, they, they essentially, you know, had to part with their, their workforce— they had to convince all the white, the poor whites, that yo, you're, you know, you're still better than them because they knew that if they got together, unionized, they would overthrow them. Yeah, they were afraid of that, and rightly so. So you know, we have to build on that. And then, of course, then we come through the civil rights, and there's no voting rights, blah blah blah. And these people, you know, they they fought for our country, and they still didn't have the rights. And and they and that's why a lot of after World War II, a lot of American GIs, Black American GIs, were like, "I'm hanging in France, man. I'm dating white chicks, and nobody's trying to kill me. <laughs> this is the best place ever." And all the bebop players, like Miles Davis and Thelonious Monk, and and all these Lockjaw Davis, they all they they stayed out in Europe because they're like, "Man, we're being treated like equals here." Oh, yeah. You know, and um, because a lot of the, the major European countries had you know colonized a lot of the African countries, so they came in and, and they were used to this kind of stuff. You know, granted, they had their, their versions of racism, too, but it wasn't as overt as we had here. And, and you know, if you read anything, <coughs> um, the um, – oh, God, who is it? Yeah, uh, it's like when um, Kennedy, um, Robert Kennedy was talking about, yeah, we're making head rows in, in civil rights. And, you know, don't be surprised in 40 years we have a black president. And, the, you know, there were black, you know, uh, civil rights leaders and activists who were going, 40 years? We're black. We've been here longer than you. <laughs> you know, we've been here 400 years. I mean, literally, they've been here in this country 400 years. And most of the white people, they can't make that claim. No. <clears throat> you know, we've been here way longer than you. Mm-hmm. And against our will, you know. And, and so, <clears throat> um, and you come out with, you know, now I talk about reparations. You know, oh, yeah, this and this and this. And I'm like, okay, you know, uh, there's the 40 acres and the mule. You never got that. You know, and my thing is, like, now it's come out, it's, it's it, you know, it's we've realized we've learned that Jack Daniels, you know, that man Jack Daniels was taught how to distill whiskey by a slave. <laughs> and there's been an investor, you know, a black woman who's invested in this and she started her own distillery using his original recipe recipe and this bourbon is called uh this whiskey is called Uncle Ernest. 
And you can buy it here. It's like 49, pound, 49 bucks for a bottle of Uncle Ernest. And I got to get a bottle of it. But really? this is the guy that taught you know, Jack Daniels how to fucking make whiskey. So my thing is, like, hey, Jack Daniels, why don't you fucking kick in a little bit in the black community for this amazing gift that you have, you know? Yeah. So I need, I need money from Jack Daniels. I need, I need, I need uh, Aunt Jemima syrup to pay up. You know, because <laughs> fuck you. Yeah. And I need, you know, um, the people who make cream of wheat because you still got a black guy on the fucking uh-huh. cover of that. Yeah. So those three, <laughs> if you gave us 1% of all the money that you've made off the back of this, I'm pretty sure we can cover the reparations thing. <laughs> no shit, right? Yeah. And by the way, if you're a Quaker, you know, and you're like, hey, I want some money too. I'm like, well, go to Quaker Roads. Right. Cause yep. They got you one of your fathers on the front of that fucking mm-hmm. thing. You, know? you got them. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, fuck you. <laughs> I want to talk about... Um, I was really impressed, Dave. Uh, the blog you have on your website, DaveFulton.com. I was reading some of the stuff on that. Oh, you read letters to my or, uh, questions from my son. Sure did. Yeah, that got a lot of hits. Wow. Yeah, that's some. You, wow, <coughs> Dave. Yeah, <laughs> I re- I I recommend anybody who's listened uh, is listening to this podcast should go and read some of that stuff. Yeah, powerful the, stuff. There's Dave. there's some stuff in there. I was just, I was mad or this that. There's it's fatherhood and then there's the other shit and. <clears throat> um, the uh, and I didn't want to get whiny, didn't want to get complaining about it. I was kind of talking about a few things that happened, and some. Um, I'm like, this is interesting. I don't know how to approach this. And then when he turned six, I thought, okay, he's becoming, you know, he's very curious, very independent. I can do it, Daddy. I can do it. Let me do it. That kind of stuff. And um, so I just decided, okay, how am I going to answer these questions? And um, so yeah, I wrote that up and I posted it on Facebook, going, hey, what do you guys think of this? And holy shit, people were sharing it. And then when I went back home to Idaho in March, uh, I went snowboarding with some friends of mine, and they and they came up to me on the ski hill and went, "Damn, man!" And I'm and they go, "These are questions and answers that I am approaching my children with now, you know, about how how do you deal with, you know, where they come from and mm-hmm. the racial issue." Yeah. And um, I mean. It, it breaks my heart, but, you know, the day will come where he's going to walk in the door and go, Daddy, somebody called me a nigger. <laughs> and and so I have to resist the temptation to go old redneck, <laughs> you know, get the gun and the baseball bat, go, where is this motherfucker? You yeah. know, that kind of thing. But And so I, I, I calmly thought about it, and I thought, oh, I have to explain to him, first off, you know, the word comes from the Dutch word of black, you know, and... um and just kind of, I don't want to ruin it for anybody that reads it, but essentially, you know, telling them that these people, you have to feel sorry for them, you know, because they're, they don't understand and they're frightened of you. Yeah. You, you, you are a threat and you have to forgive them for that. And it doesn't mean they're going to be like this forever. <clears throat> you know, they, they can be brought around. And, um, and the reason they don't want to be brought around is because things are happening too fast for them. Um, that's the problem with multiculturalism right now is in, in Europe and why the UK voted out and some other things is everything happened so fast and nobody readied them for that, that they had to, people reacted, they got scared, you know? And so if you said, man, there are a lot of immigrants in the UK right now, we expected maybe 15,000 polls to show up in the first year and there was 455,000 polls. <laughs> and if you said, Hey man, there's a lot of goddamn Polish people here. People go, what are you racist? And you're like, no. What's your problem? I'm like, because there's a lot of Polish lot. people here. Yeah. Because the UK didn't take the stance that uh, like France and Germany did, which is like they put a moratorium on any kind of you know uh, new members of the EU of like five years or seven years, depending. You know, and the UK was like, no, nah, we'll take them in right now. You just can't use the welfare state. And and they were and they went cool and they <laughs> like showed up in droves. <clears throat> and it's inevitable. I mean, it is, it's like with the storm. Eventually, you have to equalize out all the barometric pressures all over the world till we kind of get used to everybody else and how we're doing things. And we have to own up with what we've done to, you know, undeveloped countries like Africa and like Asia and, uh, and, and places in South America where we have come in as industrial nations and completely raped the resources, left them, you know, with nothing and, and it's essentially convinced them you're lucky this is all we're going to do to you kind of thing yeah and um so yeah but you know some places are kind of come up out of that and and some places are still being held back what um <clears throat> the show you're doing this week at acme hmm. you talk about 
your son. Yeah, talking about my son. Yeah, yep. yeah. and uh, well, that's the thing, you know. What, you, no, I want to know what about. <coughs> so you, I saw on Facebook you were doing something. I wrote it down here. Adapt, adopt, adapt again. Oh yeah, yeah. So what? Are, what's the similarities between <coughs> that's a, what one man show sort of thing about? Yeah, or, adapt, adopt, adapt again. Well, it's funny because we've just been shortening it to a, adapt, adopt. Um, okay. So the, it's uh, part of that what you're doing this week? No, or? I did little bits from that. The thing with that my one man show, what I did was the process we went through to get my son in into our lives and his nickname is Bam. Like Bam Bam from the the uh the Flintstones because he destroys everything. <laughs> you know. Because awesome. that's what kids do. Awesome nickname. <clears throat> yeah, so Bam. And it was um I kind of wanted to put everything in motion because the the story is is um it's real and it's not happy, and um, so I wrote a book, and um, eighty three thousand words. And I've written screenplays, but a book is a whole other thing. And it's just a matter of discipline. I wrote a thousand words a day till I got the thing done. Sometimes more than that. And so I wrote. How long has that been done? Finished. Uh, I wrote that. I finished it last fall. Okay. And uh, so I started looking for a publisher, <clears throat> and so publishers were going, "Hey, um, you know, you got to you got to have a platform now. You just can't have a really great idea, especially when it comes to biography stuff." Original story things, okay, that's fine. You can get in some of this, do that, do blogs, you know, whatever. So, um, and I was like, oh, okay. So I thought, I didn't want to do a one-man show. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll try to do a one-man show. And um, and this gal, Sarah, who runs the uh, the Glasgow Comedy Festival, I said, hey, you know, I'm going to come up and host the American thing in, in March. Can I do a one-man show about adopting my son? She's like, yeah, great. So she gave me, you know, essentially a venue and for an hour to do this, and people pay specifically to come see you. And I had like 50 people show up, and I did a couple of previews in London to work it out, and and did this uh, the show about adopting my son. And <clears throat> in the middle of it, um, it's really sad, and people cry. Wow. Um, wow. And You're not doing that part here. <laughs> no, no. And that's the thing is Dan was talking about it. He goes, oh, are you going to do the adapt adopt? I'm like, I can't because – Halfway through, it's I have a really sad part, and um, wow, <laughs> the because um, there was a uh, my my wife was mixed to diagnosed with uh, like the adoption equivalent of postnatal depression, and um, we reached out to social services and they overreacted and they took him back, and we had to fight to get him back uh, back into our lives. Holy, you just gave me chills saying that. Yes, yeah. we. Um, yeah, one of the worst days of my life is oh when, my God. when they they took him away. And I said, you know, because I, I wasn't on to the adoption thing. I was like, oh, whatever. You know, it's like, and the second week he was with us, I started bonding with him. And um, and she, you know, dropped that bomb on me. And, and I I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. And they, um, you know, they, they said, okay, we'll have a professional's meeting and figure this out. And then the next day they said, I, you know, foster mother's on the way over to pick him up. It's over. And, um <laughs> So our social worker, I said, can you stop this? And she said, no, she's here, you know. And I said, what's going to happen to him? And she's like, you'll never know. And um, so, and you were his last hope because nobody adopts black male child over the age of two. And so, um, yeah, so we packed everything up. And um, I remember walking out to the car, and he was uh, the, 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 uh, the foster mother, who's an amazing woman. I, I gave him a little kiss on the forehead, and I said, be a good person. And we're back in the house. Oh, my God. And then after a good night's sleep and, you know, a, a good meal, and my wife was like, what happened? We were asked this, our social worker, what happened to the, you know, the professionals meeting? They, well, they didn't do this, and they should have offered this. They should have offered that. They should have offered counseling. And she's like, well, then let's do that, and let's get them back. And she says, no, you can't. You, it's over. You can't get them back. They never, they never get him back. 99.9% .9 chance you will never get him back. And she didn't accept that. So um, we sent letters for five weeks to fight it, and we got local politicians involved. And eventually, a new head of the uh, the adoption services was assigned to it, and he looked into it and and um, you know interviewed us for three and a half hours. And then a week later, he sent everybody an email that said, uh, "I've met everybody involved, and I think this couple has had you know an injustice, and we should entertain putting this little boy back with them." And I was like, "Cool." I'm a redneck. I might like, put a warm jacket on him, knock on the door, and then fuck off. <laughs> but no, we had to be reevaluated, and um, it was all that kind of stuff. And it was it was a battle. It was I mean, it was one of those things where you don't realize how far you're willing to fight for something until something like that happens. And then, yeah, so we we fought like motherfuckers, and we got him back. Amazing. Yeah. So that's the show. That's the show. Wow! <coughs> wow! 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 
I, I, I hope that book. I hope I get to see it sometime. I, uh, wow, wow, Dave, wow. Yeah. So, wow. There, I'm gonna bring something up here. Um, Can we talk about something funny now? Yep. <laughs> here we go. So, no, uh, you're from North Idaho. North Idaho. Okay. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, man. So here's the thing. I do. I look up stories uh, to see if I can find a, an interesting news story from people's hometowns. Very few comedians I interview here are from Minnesota. White guy loses his dog. Okay, you think that's what it is? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Le- hold on, I, I got it here. I got to uh, flip past some other stuff. Here. Idaho, by the way, is one of those states where all the laws were thought up drunk around a campfire. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I mean, because there was a – this year, before the Idaho State Legislature, they tried to introduce a bill – to raise the legal age of marriage to 16, no. and it failed. No, no, no. No. Yeah. So no. The, the legal age of marriage in Idaho is 14. And the reason they did that is they thought it would stem off teenage pregnancy. Also, Not in a million years would I make that connection. <laughs> also in Idaho. As a teenager or as a someone I'm, that I am now. They, tr- they tried to bring forth another law that said that if a child dies because of neglect, because of religious beliefs, the parents can be charged with manslaughter. And that bill failed. So kids die in Idaho because of religious beliefs and the parents aren't prosecuted because it's freedom of religion. See? Hey, well. Also in Idaho, <laughs> yeah. um, you can legally, if you're a student, you can legally carry a concealed weapon in on campus if, oh. if you're over the age of 18. Yeah, you, wow. can, you can carry a gun to class in Idaho. Yeah. Mm, that's, wow, okay. I'm not sure how to take that. Well, this, these, the story I found is not connected to any of the things you just said. <laughs> Well, I want to get your opinion on this one. All right, this is the uh, this was the biggest and best of the crimes that I found. The news stories that it's it's a crime. Here we go. Restaurants in North Idaho reported last weekend that a pizza prankster placed to-go orders for dozens of pizzas and refused to pick up the food, resulting in hundreds of dollars in losses. <laughs> You know what's weird? Mm-hmm. I've done that. Yeah, so have I. <laughs> I've done that. I did that. I did that in high school. <laughs> I was younger. <laughs> we ordered a pizza from Domino's for a neighbor. Yeah, we us too. And then so the, we could watch. Yeah, and then no, no, and then we did it a couple of times, and, and and they're like, you know, hey, your pizza's here. I know her pizza. Oh, yeah, isn't that? So we see the guy go. God damn it! We see him walk out to the car, and we're like, going, hey man, what's going on? And they go, you know. I do, what are you going to, you know, you got, hey, can we buy a pizza from you? And the guy's going, uh, he's like, well, I got somebody ordered this money. Did you guys, no, no, we didn't, you know, yeah, we're just hungry. We thought, we thought we ordered our pizza, man. What do you got? What's well, Lord just this and that. Well, fuck, we'll give you five bucks for it, you know. <laughs> we'll give you a dollar for it. Right. All right, here you go, because we're just going to throw it away. Yeah. So we used to order like $15, you know, worth of pizza and buy it off the guy for a couple bucks. Yeah, and my buddies and I tried that once. Uh, we sat in the in a window watching the pizza guy go across the street and attempt to deliver it. And w- that was our intention is we were all going to come. We all chickened out. We didn't go outside yeah. to do it. No, we just, you know, peered through the blinds. Giggling like <laughs> yeah. children, like G- little girls. G- giggling like little girls, absolutely. Uh, but I will say these, uh, it's become a little more uh, dirty, I guess. The Flame and Cork. Is a pizza place in yeah. Idaho, apparently. Yeah. The owner said uh, the restaurant received a call. Uh, for The man requested a to-go order of 24 pizzas. <laughs> yeah. So this guy is just being, like, vindictive, maybe. <laughs> it's you know? a little obvious. Right? When, uh, when the caller said – wait, when Young – when the caller said she could make 16 pizzas, the man placed a $375 order uh, to pick up at 9, 8, or 9 p.m., in blah blah blah. Basically, uh, it gets to that they um, they even ordered like the gluten free. So like they made the the company put like extra work into making these fucking pizzas that they had no. But the thing is, but when you do that now, for. you have to give them a credit card. Yeah, you know, and do that. I mean, when, uh, when this we is a did- brand new story. Apparently. They didn't do. They didn't require that. Then, yeah. then you earned. Then you earned it. You yeah. own it. Own it. Mm-hmm. You, you you fucked up. You yeah. should have took the credit card number. Get it done. Yeah. No, yeah. they didn't. Uh-huh. No. 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 The um, <clears throat> and that's the thing. You know, like with Idaho is you um, I remember there's a, I was in court one time, uh, for speeding ticket, and the guy ahead of me, was in court because he he shot a deer from a boat. <laughs> and, wow. Yeah. And and you're not allowed to shoot a deer from the boat, and my thought was, wow. 
wow, you shot a deer from a boat? That's that's some serious skill, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's pitching up and down, and you had to time it just right and nail that thing. You, we, let him keep it, Jesus. Take his hunt license, but let him keep the dare right. for Christ's sake. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I shot a pigeon from a surfboard. Do I yeah, get to keep it. <laughs> it was like the you know um, Top Secret, that great movie with Val Kilmer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah Skeet Surfing. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Skeet Holy Surfing. God, that's probably where I got it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cigarettes, novelties, party Susie. tricks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who shoot. are you here with? You know, you know uh, <laughs> I can speak a little German. Really? Yeah, he's over there. <laughs> that was good. That that's such an underrated film. Oh, it's been so long since I've seen it. But oh, yeah, I, I love that. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And they, um, they, they they go. They had to go to the Swedish bookshop. You remember that the Swedish bookshop? And the entire thing was shot. You know, oh, was it backwards? backwards? Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, and then they played it forwards. So everybody's like, "You frick!" And that's walk. right. He's a guy. Yeah. The guy had the monocle. Oh yeah, that was as big as his eye. eye. Really, is that big? Ah, <laughs> uh, loved it. Uh, I just have one more thing I'm going to mention. Um, this is it has nothing to do with anything we've talked about. I bought uh, tickets months ago to go to a concert tonight. I'm really excited about. It. I'm going to go see Jeff Lynne's ELO. No. Yes. Strange magic. Yes. Whoa. Fuck. Just wow. Yes. ELO. Yes. <coughs> so excited. Wow. Uh, and I don't, I'm not really into concerts. The last concert I saw that blew me away was Foo Fighters. And okay. I, I would I would cancel work to go see him again. Yep. I've seen and I them. met Dave Grohl because I was doing the Lowlands Festival in Holland, and and they were the headlining act, and the um so I went to the catering you know, tent thing they set up. And it said, Foo Fighters crew. And I thought, oh, it's just the crew. I walk in, there's fucking Dave Grohl. Nice. Walked right up to him and started talking. Nicest guy in the world. Yeah. Just, yeah. And nice you know what they guy. say, for a musician, really funny. Yeah, That's yeah. What say about him. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this morning, I was on social media and saw somewhere where someone had posted the set list of, of uh, what Jeff Lynn's been doing on this tour. I refuse to look at it. Oh, okay. I don't want to know. No, you want to be surprised. I want to be surprised. Yeah. What what are your thoughts on that? Would you rather, do you like surprises? Do, would you want to know in advance what's no, coming? No, no, no. Because I, I, if I'm sitting there, I, I want to th- you know because I'm going to have my favorite ELO s- song. Yeah. And you think to yourself, okay, you know he's, he hasn't played it yet. Oh man, he's going to close on this, or is this his on- encore? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to like you know oh, I'm going to try to identify it as quick as possible those because, first couple notes or something that's you, magical. And ELO when they toured they used to have this amazing stage show like lights and everything. They'll be curious to see if they bring all that back out. Yeah, I yeah. mean he there are zero original members. It's only Jeff Lynne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I don't know if you know, but like they toured as ELO two at one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so. it's kind of like the, you know the specials. <laughs> uh, Jerry Dahmer's was part with everybody else, and then when they got back together. He wouldn't tour them. He's like, "Fuck you, and this and that." And he thought, "You guys aren't going to make it on your own." And they did. <laughs> and um, Terry Hall, the lead singer for the Specials, he's a white guy. The thing when the Specials came out, the whole two tone thing in 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 England, people loved that whole sky thing, Scott thing. Scott, yeah. <laughs> and um, and you know, Root Boys. And then when they saw these guys, they saw the, the, the they loved the, the the records. And then they saw them tour, and it was like you know, black and white guys on stage. And there was a lot of people going, "What the hell is this?" So they, they really kind of brought a whole community of people together that may not have gotten together anyway. And um, and I did the show called Never Mind the Buzzcocks in 2004. Uh, it was on the BBC. It was it was great because it was a music trivia show. Everybody on there had to know something about music. And they'd always get like a couple of music musician guys on there. And um, and I did it with Terry Hall. And he's a really nervous guy and but amazing talent. So we got to kind of be friends a little bit. And he so he came and saw me at the comedy store in London. And um, it was great because I told the comedy store, I go, look, I got a guest coming in on Friday or Thursday, uh, Terry Hall. And they go, oh, like from the specials. I go, yeah, it is him. And they're like, holy shit. So they allocated an area and nobody bothered him. And at the end, we're trying to talk a little bit. And then he goes, uh, so Dave, what do you got going on next? I'm like, well, I'm getting married, you know, and um, in, in a few months. Uh, and he goes, oh, wow, do you have a wedding singer? And I remember thinking to myself, what a weird thing to ask. And I was almost going to make fun of him. I'm like, what the fuck do I want that from? Adam Sandler? You know, that kind of bullshit. Sure, right. so, so I said, uh, I, I said no. And he goes, can I do it? <clears throat> I went, yeah, right. I said, wife. So my wife, who's a huge specials fan, I said, Terry Hall was at the, oh, how'd it go? Yeah, he wants to sing at our, our wedding reception. He's like, and she goes, what? What? You know? Yeah. Yeah, long story short, he sang at my wedding reception. He sang a Burt Bacharach song at the end of the night. We all slow danced to it. 
you know, his wife was there, who's, you know, Lindy, she's amazing. And, um, and he was there and he's like, you know, so we got done and my, my wife and I, I walked up and go, Hey Terry, thanks for doing this. And, you know, he goes, yeah, you look lovely. He goes, congratulations. My wife goes, thank you. No problem. I really appreciate this. It was very lovely. He goes, yeah, no problem. Then she pauses and goes, I had a picture of you on my wall. <laughs> I go, all right, honey, just wait, just step away, step away. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Nicest guy in the world. But now they're touring again. They just put out a new album and the album's amazing. And yeah. So, um, yeah, I'd go see, I, 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 he got me in to see when their first tour, got to, went to Br- Brixton Academy and, and saw him play live, and it was just, it was great, all these old Sky guys, Ska guys in their, like, 50s and 60s, like, tr- still trying to, you know, dance, and you see <laughs> them dance, like, two songs, and they're, like, holding on to, <gasps> <laughs> you know. <clears throat> so, sit this one out. Yeah, so I'm, the ELO thing, I think, that, it probably won't be, you know, people jumping up a little bit, but I mean, you never know, you know. Yeah, yeah, they'll be, good. be sitting down and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that'll be great, man. Yeah, um, everyone else needs to come here and see you either tonight, Friday, Saturday, uh, and don't uh, take five years to come back again. No, okay. no, I, I won't. I won't. I, um, I've been uh, chastised for that already, and and um, so yeah, I'll uh, I'll talk to uh, Lewis. Uh, I love Lewis because he he hates everybody, and and so we all get along with him well. <laughs> and uh, and and I tell people uh, in the in the uh, in the UK, I'm like the Ac- Acme Comedy Club is stuck by everybody for so long. It's, it's one of the top ten clubs in, in America, without a doubt. And um, well, uh, Lewis Lee, the owner of this place, uh, defines loyalty. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like the fact that he does stuff that pisses everybody off. Oh, you can't do that. can't hire that guy. He's like, fuck you. Mm-hmm. And he does it anyway. Yep. I think it's great. It's totally great. agree. Dave, thank you. This has been great. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks for catching up. Let's do it again sooner. Sue. Yes. <laughs>